Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Your Drone Questions Answered. Today, we're going to be talking about DJI geofencing, or maybe the lack of geofencing now. And today, as a guest, is someone named Chris Breedlove. Chris, thank you for jumping on the Your Drone Questions Answered show with me. Good to be here, David. Fun fact about Chris that I also want to talk about real quick before we dive in is that Chris is actually going to be the new host of Your Drone Questions Answered. So I know I stepped in for a little bit to host for a few episodes. I'm excited to get Chris uh, in the mix here, hosting some exciting guests. Chris has a pretty cool background when it comes to drones in the industry. So Chris, give us like the 30 second intro about who you are, a little background of uh, your experience in the drone world, and then we'll dive into some geofencing. My drone journey is coming up on maybe actually two years flat in the next I don't know, 60 days or so, March, March, April. Um, my long-standing background for 10, 11, 12 years is all geospatial. So I've been a GIS person forever, been using Esri software for all different applications for that decade plus. Um, but my opportunity in drones just started about, yeah, almost two years ago when the company I work for, we're one of the largest Trimble dealers in the world. So I think conventional GNSS, survey equipment, and so on. Our drone rep at the time left for a different opportunity. I kind of raised my hand and said, hey, Drones seem pretty cool, really hadn't done much with them, minus what everybody's done, right? Kind of playing with a toy at your buddy's house or whatever. <laughs> so that's been kind of the beginning of that journey. And it's been a lot of fun. Like I mentioned, that whole kind of framework has been on the mapping side of things. I have customers who take drones and do really interesting other things with them, bridge inspections or water sampling, whatever. That's not my sort of forte, but I enjoy every day, honestly, supporting those folks, learning from them new applications. And I mean, that's why we're into drones, right? Things evolve. I feel like under our feet every day. Sometimes you're like taken for a ride. And it's hard to keep up. Sometimes that's what really makes it exciting. So anyway, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. So you got a lot of experience doing geospatial stuff. And if you haven't heard, so we have some advanced mapping courses that we filmed live last fall and they should be coming out. The final version should be coming out this spring. And Chris was actually one of the instructors for one of our advanced mapping course programs. So he teaches GNSS, which is basically, you know, those GPS receivers, GNSS is just all the satellite constellations. Uh, so GNSS and survey control. So how to do targets, shoot stuff, get your maps really accurate. So he taught that and you've sold a lot of this equipment. So you know the equipment really well. Um, but he's flown everything from M350s to but you sell Skydios and M3 enterprises and all sorts of different things. So more on the enterprise side, right? 100%. Technically not Skydio. Wish we had oh, access no to the product line, but a lot of things from DJI up to all the other American made multi rotors, think free fly, whisper inspired flight, things of that nature, third party yeah, LIDAR payloads, and then fixed wings as well, Wingtra, Quantum System. So, pretty, a uh, pretty broad portfolio of products and obviously the software that goes with it. But like I said, my company, Duncan Parnell, we're about the solution, right? I think in drones, it's really fun to have something cool that flies, and it is, but for our customers, flying is great, you know, that, that's wonderful, but they need to get quality data. And there's a lot of drones that fly well, but don't necessarily integrate the payloads, whether it's LiDAR cameras. So that's kind of what we're here for is to stay in that gap for our customers, be their advocate, right? Be their solution provider and, and connect those workflows. Sweet. Cool. Well, I'm excited for you to bring your experience working with all these different types of customers, understanding all these platforms, drones, and sensors, and have some cool episodes on the show. You got a pretty big network of people in the drone world. So it'll be nice to see who we can uh, get on here and hopefully answer some drone questions. And we'll cover stuff, obviously, continue for the whole drone world, not just mapping and inspection per se. Today, let's talk about DJI geofencing. One of the big, I don't know, news topics that people love to freak out in the news. Oh my gosh, can you believe this? Uh, so one of the big news headlines, I guess, is that DJI removes geofencing. Sounds like the Chinese want everyone to crash their drones into critical infrastructure. Ah, uh, you know. Um, so let's talk about what you think about it. Pros, cons, is this good? Is this bad? If you're watching this on YouTube, maybe throw some comments. Do you think it's a good idea, bad idea? I'd love to hear what you guys think. But I'll start with you, Chris. What do you think about DJI? And if, by the way, if you're not familiar with what geofencing is, it essentially like makes it so the drone can't fly into certain areas. So for a long time, DJI had it to where if you were gonna go, fly your drone right over an airport, if it was a big airport, it wouldn't let you do that unless you sort of unlocked it um, with some kind of permission authorization proof. And no other drone manufacturer really had that except for DJI. And now DJI basically said, yeah, we're not going to do that anymore. So that's what we're talking about, geofencing. It's kind of keeping your drone out of certain areas automatically. The drone physically wouldn't fly there, but they don't have that anymore. So Chris, what do you think? Is that good? Is that bad? I have a lot of different thoughts to it, David. 
I guess first you hit the nail on the head. Nobody else, and I say nobody, there might be some obscure drone that you and I have never touched or heard of, probably not, honestly, but none of the normal, ubiquitous, available commercial drones did it, at least not to that degree, right? So the counterpoint to that is, so maybe it's it's fine, right? It kind of fits what experience, keyword there, experienced pilots are already used to having that responsibility on their own shoulders. On the other hand, I could go buy, you know, Mini 4 Pro or Nevada down the street. I could see the card in the box. Oh, yeah, that's interesting and discard it. And all of a sudden now I could cause real harm, right? Like we saw in L.A. with that that pilot hitting the, the firefighting aircraft. So I see I see both sides of that. I do think with DJI being, I think, depending on who you ask, what, 70, 80 plus percent of the worldwide market and really probably more than that for the recreational market, there's a lot greater risk of bad acting or just really ignorance, you know, having consequence versus I won't name anyone else just to not pick on somebody, but nobody else has as many units out there flying. So the risk is greater for DJI. I also think this is just me spitball. I have no inside information, but if I'm DJI, I feel like the presence of geofencing uh, in the restricted zone that we're talking about specifically was maybe an attempt to maintain, or really I should say avoid even worse PR than they're already getting. And yeah. it seems like that ship has kind of sailed. I know you've tackled that a lot late last year. So if DJI is saying, you know what, we're already kind of losing the PR game anyway, this isn't like helping us engender additional goodwill. Why not just get rid of it? Because I will tell you, and I've seen other people do all this online, another Chinese manufacturer, a lot of, I mean, I think they're at, what, top three, top five in the world for market share, just trailing DJI pretty much, and maybe one other. They don't have geofencing, right? I've, I have plenty of customers. You know what? I want an M3E, let's say, but I'm going to get one of the Evo variants just to avoid that little bit of a headache. So from a competitive perspective, that's no longer an issue with DJI. People might go ahead and buy a Matrice 4 or an M3E or whatever anyway, versus picking the option for no other reason than it just doesn't have that. So I, I could see both sides. I think we'll see a mixed bag. We'll continue to see some new stories of folks that would have been locked out. They didn't even know what a Lance authorization was. It was never going to take off. So that might be a missed opportunity maybe to avoid an incident. On the other hand, hey, we need to be better as a drone community and and remind our fellows that that guy, said, hey, man, like, have you heard about this? Not to like bother people, but just to educate so that we all can continue doing what we love to do with our tools. Yeah, I think those are some good points. I was just curious. I mean, I guess we would just be speculating, but like, why now kind of thing? I guess you said like, maybe because hey, we're already losing the PR battle. Why not just let it? But it seems like, how does this help them? Obviously, they would. I don't think they would just do it willy-nilly. A couple of things that entered my mind, I'm not saying this is correct, but it was sort of like, okay, hey, you're going to ban DJI drones? Well, was this like a retaliatory thing? Like, well, we'll just unlock geofencing. But I'm like, I, I don't think that would, that doesn't really make sense. Like, I don't think that would help them, you know? So I don't know what the the motivations were, like why now, I guess, you know what I'm saying? It's funny that everybody, you know, jumps to national concern, national security concerns, like, oh, see, they want information about our critical infrastructure and they want all this stuff. And it's like, well, if they were really that heavily influenced by the Chinese government, like they could have turned this off a long time ago. Like, so it makes less sense to me that all of a sudden it's like, they want this information, so now they're going to turn it off. They did more than they needed to do. They were almost like, I don't want to say this in like a bad way, but like doing the FAA's job for them by building this into the software, hurting themselves commercially, you could say. But it's like people won't buy them because they have this feature, maybe to like try to be more accepted in the US by regulators. I don't know. Maybe they're just like, well, that didn't work. Regulators don't like us anyway, so screw it. Like, I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I, I think it totally could be. Like I said, we're, we're speculating on the motivations here. I think the yeah. timing is definitely interesting. Then again, I mean, it's been years and years and years, right? But this was early days of DJI really coming on the scene. And obviously, everybody's going through that or has gone through that, right? I mean, DJI is just so far ahead of the game from a timing investment, right? Like, DJI had the same problems that, you know, less mature drone companies are even experiencing now in 2025. They've just, they hit that benchmark in their evolution of product engineering reliability just a long time ago, right? So to your point, it's like if they had gotten rid of it in the early days when maybe crashes or like just things falling out of the sky were a lot more ubiquitous because their platform wasn't mature, that would have given them even more of a black eye like earlier in the game. Yeah. Now they've True. got the black eye, like we're saying, no matter what. And so I don't know. It's like I said, I mentioned it a few moments ago. I've not heard of that many people say, you know what? And people love Altel. That's great. I'm not here to, to dunk on Altel. I think most people, if they want a DJI, they just have made peace with, you know what? When I'm near those certain sites, 
and it's not that hard to get a lance authorization, right? Um, or if you're working for the airport, if it, I mean, nowadays, probably not, but go back a few years, if you were contracted by the airport, you're either going to buy just a non DJI drone to get that task done, you still have to comply. It's not like DJI was making up these restricted zones, at least I should say for the most part, or I'll just say for my experience, right? Some of the warning zones would make you kind of laugh. You're like, mm, this polygon is maybe over what the FAA has on their own maps and that kind of thing. If I'm DJI, I'm going to round up, right? To make sure I don't have any issues. On the other hand, there's times like, I think I, or you have to get a lance authorization. You're not even in a restricted zone. So it was never a perfect thing. How could it be, right? It's a data issue as well for whoever deigns to put that in their software, right? So I don't know. It, the timing's fascinating. Is this a PR, you know, an attempt, like we said, to improve their PR? Maybe. Is it just a... Eight years overdue. They wish they'd done it a long time ago. That, that's also possible. But maybe, yeah. Got to be a better drone community, be more responsible, no matter what, right? Because I can take off with anything else willy nilly and also spy with, let's be honest, a better camera, right? I could put a 100 megapixel camera on a big honking fixed wing or, or, you know, hexacopter and do the exact same thing. And it never had geofencing anyway. So. Which is the why the whole, I don't know. It's why the whole DJI argument is so funny to me. They're like, oh, this is a huge national security risk. I'm like, you can do this with so many other things right now. If you really wanted, to, like if the Chinese government was like really wanting to like collect this information, there's so many other ways to do that than to be like, yeah, let's hack consumer drones and grab everybody's data. It seems like a very inefficient way to, right. to spy. I don't know. I'm not a spy, but just my personal thoughts. I was going to give an example. Most of my time is spent like running drone launch and some of our other curriculum stuff now. But, you know, earlier on, I would take paid drone jobs as they would come up with friends or people I knew, right? They're like, hey, wait, can you do this for me? I was like, sure. So I had a friend doing like a video production company and he didn't needed me to film to the side of this car. I was obeying the rules. I wasn't flying directly over traffic, but they needed me to kind of like follow this car down the road because they were had some new traffic stuff the city was doing and they were trying to time how long it would take to get from here to here. And they were sort of trying to like sell it to like the people that lived in the city. Like, hey, see, this isn't so bad. And they had like the mayor in the car. So I was flying, but it crossed over sort of one of those geofenced zones, like into class D airspace. Now I went and I got my Lance authorization and I was like all good to go. But I had unlocked, I think my friends like Mavic 2 Pro at the time I was using that. And I don't remember what it was, like batteries died or maybe something else was going on with it. And I was like, ah, you know what? I'll switch over. I had this like, or like this uh, not Mavic, Air 2S. So I switched over to the Air 2S. I still had my Lance authorization, but I forgot I hadn't unlocked that specific like controller for that drone with the Lance authorization. So when we got in the air and we're flying, all of a sudden they're going and I'm following this car a little off to the side. And then the drone just stops midair. It's like, oh, you can't go there because it's locked. And the car just drives off and I had to be like radioing. I'm like, hey guys, I got to like start over. Hold on, come back. My drone got stuck. And it's just like kind of, it just made me look stupid, which again, it was my fault. I should have known, but I had the authorization to be there. Like I was doing everything fine. I just forgot to unlock that specific controller. So again, kind of a petty example, but it would have been nice in that instance not to have that problem. Another comment I saw online that I thought was interesting was someone was like, hey, well, at least this maybe puts some more heat on some of the regulators to like actually come up with some good solutions versus just relying on, oh, well, DJI is geofenced everybody anyway. So for the majority of people, it's going to keep them out of these areas. Now they have to, I don't know, come up with some better ideas on how to have compliance and you know, that kind of stuff. I totally get that. I don't envy the FAA, right, to have that responsibility. I mean, can you imagine, like, if you've been in aviation for a long time? I mean, who could have foreseen just the explosion of things, you know, aircraft in the airspace? Most of them could be yay big. So, I mean, they, they have a tough job. So I, I give them that. But I think that's also a good thing, right? To your point, U.S. just aviation as, as a holistic picture. You talk about, like, the this is going way off to the weeds now, but, like, unmanned, like, helicopter-type taxis, right, advanced air mobility, well, all that has to somehow fit together with tiny consumer drones and drone delivery. Like it's complicated and we, they can never have relied on DJI solely or primarily for those things either. So I agree with that sentiment. Maybe this does provide a little bit extra onus, but are we going to see new stories? I'll just say this. We'll, we will continue to see. And I guess there obviously was no restricted zone because it was a TFR right out there in LA that somebody violated. How do you put that into all the apps? Because that's like a real time things change. But we yeah. will see those types of incidents unquestionably, I think, more often. Hopefully it's still very rare. Hopefully it's like once a quarter, you know, pretty, pretty seldom, but it's going to happen. But I think we just got to, again, as an industry, hold each other accountable. This might be a place I shouldn't go, but like, I think about it like gun ownership, right? Just because I have a right to possess a firearm legally in a certain environment, I might make people around me uncomfortable 
or give fellow gun owners a bad name. People might not like that analogy, but I think it's apropos yeah. to drone pilots. Just because I'm allowed to be there um, or I'm physically not prevented from flying there, I might actually be illegal and or at least creating bad PR, right? So we got to be as responsible as we can so that to your point, David, the FAA doesn't say, you know what, to heck with this. This is becoming a nightmare. There's more and more manned you know, drone collisions, we now have to just really clamp down the industry. That would be bad for a lot of our livelihoods and what we also enjoy doing. So we got to be responsible yeah. as we can as a collective, I think is is the bottom line. Yeah, I think the gun ownership thing, you know, again, sometimes it gets people fired up, but it's like, it's something that could potentially be hazardous and it's on the owner to like, there's a difference between legal and responsible. You know, it's like, yes. oh, I'm within the bounds of the law. Yeah, but you're being a moron. And you know, there's the balance. And I also think, you know, similar to gun ownership, right? It's like, yeah, if you're going to do that, you now have the responsibility to educate yourself on like, hey, what do the laws actually say? Oh, in my state, what is actually considered self-defense versus not like, oh, someone's just, if someone's trying to steal my car, can I shoot them? You know, it's like, no. It's where you think, oh, I can do this. I'm within my rights, but maybe you're not. So if you now have this thing, not again, not that drones are guns, but a drone has a potential to hit an aircraft or do, you know, whatever, do other stuff on a very smaller scale, educate yourself so that A, you don't get yourself in trouble and B, you don't accidentally do something dumb, cause harm somewhere else. I see this a lot at the beach too. I'm in Florida, a lot of beaches. You're on the beach, popular spot for drones because it's cool scenery to shoot, right? Also a popular spot for low flying aircraft because also it's cool scenery. So yeah. like I've been at the beach flying my drone. I was in a class D airspace. I had authorization to be there, all this stuff, right? And still, man, helicopters, seaplanes coming in to like land, parasailing, all this crap. I was constantly like, oh, oh crap, you know, like avoiding, you know, or, you know, it wasn't no with the close calls, but you just, you hear a propeller, you're like, rah, you know, a plane coming, you're like, oh crap. So yeah, just people need to be responsible. Absolutely. All right, cool. Well, we've talked enough about this. Let us know if you're watching this on, on YouTube below in the comments, or if you're listening, you can email us if you want. What do you think about geofencing? Is this a good idea, bad idea? Is going to help the industry, hurt the industry? I guess we'll see. But something that's interesting. So if you have a DJI drone, go update your stuff and you shouldn't be locked out geofencing anymore. Just don't go do anything dumb. Absolutely. And David, I'll, I'll take our sign off here. So as David mentioned, I'm going to be the podcast host for your drone questions answer moving forward. Really looking forward to that. So as always, as folks who've been listening for a long time know, please submit your questions on the community, the drone launch community, or at ydqa.io. Really looking forward to the journey for the rest of 2025. Uh, one more thing. If you just want to email Chris your questions too, it's, his email is very complicated. It's just chris at dronelaunchacademy.com. You can send it in to him directly. Um, so wherever is most convenient. All right. Until next time.